Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here for Crimpton News First at Four. We begin tonight as Hurricane Ian is slamming the Florida coast with powerful winds and extremely heavy rain at this hour. Take a look. Just hours ago, the storm hit the coast as a Category 4 hurricane. That means it's got more than 150 mile an hour sustained wind speeds. Torrential rain has already brought extreme flooding to Naples, Florida. A downed power line from Hurricane Ian caused a fire in the middle of all of that flood. The catastrophic storm surge and even tornado threats have all been forecasted as this storm is slowly marching forward. Tonight, CBS's Jason Allen is in Tampa, which already is feeling the powerful impacts of this storm. Hurricane Ian has arrived on U.S. shores, a powerful lumbering storm that's expected to batter millions in Florida. Uh, we have seen uh, life threatening storm surge uh, as was predicted. Uh, we've also seen major flooding in places like Collier County, Sanibel, Fort Myers Beach. Oh. Hurricane hunters flying directly into Ian felt the storm's power and satellite imagery shows lightning in the eye wall as Ian approached. Officials are warning of dangerous flooding and life-threatening storm surge. Some place is going to get two feet of rain. It's moving that slow. Flooding began on these streets in Naples while Ian was still offshore, and downed power lines sparked this fire. Residents in the highest risk areas were warned. If they hadn't gotten out by this morning, it was too late. I urge Floridians who have made the decision to shelter in place, to stay indoors, and stay off the roads. But the curious came out to Tampa Bay earlier as water receded from the shoreline. It's been pushing water out of the bay. This is a swimming area usually, and right now you can walk on it. It's like one in a lifetime thing. These Michigan residents have never experienced a hurricane. We see if we can get a, a good glimpse of anything while we're here. But there is serious business ahead as Ian bears down. FEMA has hundreds of boots on the ground and has pre-positioned food and water supplies. Florida's governor is already forecasting a long recovery. This is not just a 48-hour ordeal. This is going to be something that is going to be there for days and weeks and months. Ian is expected to move across central Florida and exit Daytona Beach sometime tomorrow. Jason Allen, CBS News, Tampa. And we, of course, will continue tracking this and watching it as it marches up the Florida coast. Our chief meteorologist, Jeremy Legoo, also, I know, Jeremy, you have been tracking this hurricane throughout the afternoon. Tell us a little more about what we know kind of about the path of this storm. Is it going where we thought it would? Yeah, it's kind of going exactly where we thought it would. Unfortunately, though, when you're dealing with a storm of this magnitude, you're just kind of waiting it out. When it comes to a storm this big, this strong, and once you get into that major hurricane category, you are talking catastrophic damage. That's a satellite image from earlier today as that storm was making landfall. We currently do have landfall and as it moves inland, it will continue to weaken. Winds are still very, very, very strong. Uh, maximum sustained winds now at a 140. It says 150, but we are at a 140 currently. So let's switch here and there we go. Updated the graphic, but notice it is now slowing down, moving north northeast at eight miles per hour. We're starting to see it reach that category three strength. So it is weakening, but keep in mind category three, category four, category five. Those are considered major hurricanes. The reason they are considered major hurricanes is because they pack enough of a punch to damage modern infrastructure. That's a big deal. When you're talking each of those categories, each one has more deadly impacts that it might have. Now, as this thing moves to the north, we're going to watch it kind of move out of the region rather quickly. So this category one will actually be later on tonight. I think by the time we get in the 10 and 11 o'clock hour locally, we are down to a category one, if not a tropical storm. But then this thing moves off the coast, regathers itself, stays a powerful storm, and then moves up into the Carolinas and that movement into the Carolinas will likely be late Friday into Saturday. So we're far from done when it comes to Ian and what we're going to continue to see. But shifting gears, we're going to head back locally and talk what we've got going on here in Spokane because all in all, not a bad day. Temperatures in the mid 70s still, so we are quite a bit cooler than where we were yesterday. But an incoming storm off the coast brings us our next chance at some pretty widespread showers. We'll talk those and cooler temperatures coming up in your full forecast. 
All right, sounds good, Jeremy. Thank you. And as Hurricane Ian hits this week, the Eastern Washington University football team is still planning to fly to Florida despite the storm. Saturday's scheduled football game between Eastern and the University of Florida Gainesville was moved to Sunday in hopes that the storm will have passed through by then. However, again, the stadium there does not have a roof, so it is possible that game may ultimately be canceled or have to be rescheduled. As of now, though, kickoff still set for 9 a.m. our time on Sunday morning. Now we are just learning right now about a new lawsuit stemming from the Coeur d'Alene Pride Festival back in June. A Kootenai County drag performer suing a blogger for defamation. According to court documents, the blogger falsely accused the performer of exposing themselves during a performance at that event. That same blogger also posted a video of the performance online with edits that implied nudity. Now, prosecutors determined the performer didn't do anything wrong and declined to prosecute. Also during that same Pride event, 31 men were found in the back of a U-Haul with shields and a seven-page plan to riot. As members of the hate group Patriot Front were prepared to go on trial now, Krem 2's Kyle Simchuk spoke with a veterans group now calling on prosecutors to crack down on neo-Nazis. Well, the group is called Task Force Butler, made up of volunteer vets around the country. Founder Christopher Goldsmith told me they're upset watching our democracy being destroyed by Americans from within. He spent years researching this hate group, its members, and the laws already on the books that can be used to hold them accountable. Krem2 News was there in June as authorities stopped a U-Haul a few hundred feet from Coeur d'Alene's Pride event, arresting the 31 masked men inside. Pictures and videos spread around the country. Underneath the, the, the mask that the Patriot Front Gang uh, wears are neo-Nazis. They are people who believe in genocide. They are people who want to actively work to make the United States a white ethno state. Christopher Goldsmith has studied the racist organization for years. They can commit acts of violence, walk back into a crowd, and then the police who may even witness the violence say, well, I don't know which masked member of this gang it was. Coeur d'Alene wasn't the first or last time the group has popped up. In July of 2021, they assaulted a black man during a march in Philadelphia. They did exactly the same thing Independence Day weekend in Boston. They sought out, attacked a black man, beat him with shields. Goldsmith focuses on these three incidents in the 237 page report Project Butler put together, identifying members, how the group operates, and existing laws he believes prosecutors can use against them. I hope that the city of Coeur d'Alene is not left responsible for trying to, uh, to find justice and, and take down this violent terrorist gang. Really needs to be the feds because every one of those um, conspiracies to commit hate crimes are interstate. Goldsmith has shared his report with prosecutors in Kootenai County and the attorneys general in Idaho, Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, hoping they can work together and share information to bring more serious charges and penalties against the group, which Goldsmith says should be treated as a street gang. Well, these attorney generals can bankrupt this uh, this violent gang. They can force them to not have the money to travel around the country and try and terrorize, uh, you know, frequently marginalized communities. We are here to make sure that justice is found, to work with law enforcement, and to ensure that these, uh, that American cities are free from fascists and neo-Nazis. So far, the 31 men arrested have been charged with conspiracy to riot, which is punishable by up to one year in jail and a $5,000 fine. The first trials are scheduled to start next month. In the newsroom, Kyle Simchuk, Krem2 News. The body of a famous ski climber raised in Seattle, Hillary Nelson, was found in Nepal overnight. Search crews found her remains after a two-day search. She fell down a crevasse while skiing down the world's eighth highest mountain in Nepal. Her body was flown to a hospital where doctors now plan to perform an autopsy. Nelson was a world-renowned mountaineer. She made more than 40 expeditions to 16 different countries. She was known as the most prolific ski mountaineer of her generation. She was 49 years old and now leaves behind two children. 
Gritman Medical Center in Moscow, Idaho, is pushing back on an announcement that the U University of Idaho will restrict birth control access on campus. Earlier this week, public universities in Idaho began warning employees not to refer students to abortion providers or tell them how to get emergency contraception. The University of Idaho and Boise State University are both now telling staff they could face criminal charges after a law was passed last year. Gritman Medical Center has a contract with the university to manage the U of I Vandal Health Clinic. In a letter obtained by Creme 2 News, Gritman Health says providers, clinicians and staff at the Vandal Health Clinic provide health care services in accordance with applicable state and federal laws. These services include access to contraceptives and other forms of birth control as prescribed by a licensed clinician. It goes on to say the clinics will not change as a result of the memo sent out recently by the University of Idaho's leadership. Starting this coming Monday, the next phase of the Thor Freya construction project will begin. So once again, drivers need to be prepared for changes and new detours. The intersection of Freya and Hartson will be closed to traffic and all drivers will then be rerouted. Traffic will now detour down 8th. This next phase of the project is focusing on water, line and under, on water lines and underground utilities work. The city is asking drivers to be patient and be ready for those new detours. In construction season, there's, you know, we're faced with a lot of changing environments. So, uh, you know, stay alert, watch for the signs. They could change on a daily basis um, and follow those detour signs. It's really important to keep crews safe, to slow down in those construction zones, uh, to keep everyone safe while they're doing that important work. The Thor Freya project is expected to wrap up hopefully no later than November, at least for this phase. Coming up tonight at 6, we'll hear more about how businesses are once again being impacted by this project. And still to come here on Creme 2 News at 4 tonight, Spokane schools discussing a new plan to educate parents on gun safety. Their message when we come back.